Welcome back to Ask Confluent, where we answer questions from the internet. I'm your host, Gwen Shapira, and with me today we have special guest, Jason Gustafsson. Uh, Jason is a member of the Apache Kafka PMC, which is pretty big deal. It's even better than being a committer, which everyone knows is a big deal. And he's an engineer here at Confluent. And we got him to the show to answer some big questions about Kafka and exactly once and kind of more advanced topics for the show. We got a request from the audience that they want more advanced topics on the show. So here we are. Let's get started. Now, before we start, there's something I'm kind of curious about. So you work at Confluence core Kafka team. That's right, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where, and this is kind of a cool team, right? You're working on the open source Apache Kafka, the brokers. There's probably like 100,000 engineers around the world using what you write, which is kind of incredible. Do you still hire for the team? Yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking for all experience levels. Um, so maybe it's useful if I describe the core team a little bit. Yeah. OK, so on the core team, yeah, we're focused on um, the broker internals. So we focus on the, the storage layer. We focus on the replication layer, the core clients, um, and uh, exactly one semantics, which we'll be talking about in, in, this, in this session. Um, so what does it take to be a team? Like, if I want to get accepted, am I good enough? <laughs> Gwen is good enough, for, of course. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're, as I said, we're looking for at all, all experience levels. So if you're a, a junior engineer or you have a lot of experience, we look for both. Uh, I think in general what we're looking for is, uh, you know, smart people who, who are enthusiastic about Kafka, um, who are enthusiastic about distributed systems. So, you, you know, if you have some experience already in distributed systems, it's a plus or at the storage layer, but it's not a prerequisite. So really, we just look for smart people, you know, good at communication, um, but we're, we're hiring. Um, yeah, we, we, we want to grow the team quite a bit. It's amazing. So all of you who, if you're watching this show, you're obviously an engineer who is enthusiastic about Kafka. So consider the idea of actually writing Kafka itself. OK, and for our first question, uh, it's a question from the podcast. And they gave us five stars. So we like them. That's why we picked the question. It's a two-part question. And the first part is, what's your suggestion on how many partitions a topic can have? So is there a limit to how many partitions a topic can have? Yeah, that's a good question. I think and there's, there's a lot of uh, confusion about this topic. Um, so there's the, the limit um, you know, that most people are concerned about is really the total number of partitions inside a single cluster. So, um, but on a topic level, you, know, you, do, you do want to choose enough partitions that you can uh, parallelize the load. So people are often concerned about either parallelization at the producer level or on the consum consumption side. So a typical thing that we recommend is that you, you keep in mind the, the growth of your application over time and uh, you know, over partitions. So if you do some you know, back of the napkin calculations, you think you need um, you know, 16 processes in the long term, you may just consider doubling that and do something like 32. You know, overall, um, the, the, there's there's no specific limit uh, on a on a per topic level. Uh, as I said, it's just it's more like at the cluster level. Um, Do you have any number like what's the largest topic you've ever seen? Like in terms of how many partitions? We see thousands. You know, that's that's not a atypical. I think these use cases tend to be a little bit rare. I think uh, more common is you know if you're considering the just the throughput requirements of your application, you know you you'd need something you know like 32 to 64. I would say is pretty common, and that gives you quite a lot of room for growth. Yeah, and then I've seen cases where someone shows up and say, hey, I'm a big bank. We have 100,000 accounts in my bank. Clearly, we need to have a partition to each account so they wouldn't mix together. That's kind of an anti-pattern, right? You don't need that level of parallelism. Yeah, some of these use cases, I think, yeah, when, when you have some kind of in interconnection that you're trying to represent through partitions. Um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's. You just need to keep in mind the overall limits. I, I don't know if I would call it an anti-pattern necessarily. Yeah, um, but I mean, there's no reason why not to really have multiple da data types in the same partition and kind of find it out later if the overall parallelism works for you. That's true. Yes, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. I think uh, you know the main thing you're trying to tr trying to get is good utilization for your partitions. So if if you, you know combining them allows you to get but more out of a single partition, you should absolutely do so. Yes, and now for the for me the more interesting part of the question. 
Uh, Deokar also asked, could you talk about exactly one's feature and its pros and cons for using it? And that's a pretty good question. Like, why shouldn't everyone just go and use exactly once for everything? Yeah, uh, so we can talk about that a little bit. And, yes. and I think the short answer is, you know, no, nothing comes for free. So exactly <laughs> once is an improvement over the normal semantics. So y there, there are some costs. So Does it make Kafka really slow? People always think that exactly once make Kafka really slow. No, it definitely doesn't <laughs> do that. Um, so it may be useful uh, if we can uh, just describe what, what problem uh, exactly once is actually solving. Um, so really, you know, it's designed for Kafka streams. So if you imagine you have a, you know, a Kafka streams application. So this is going to be a very simplified version. But typically, you have uh, a number of input partitions, which are feeding into the, the streams application. And you have some output partitions. OK, now what, what um, you're concerned about when it comes to exactly one semantics is the guarantees that you get in, inside this processing. So as we're taking the data from the input uh, partitions, we're doing the processing aggregation, uh, and then we're writing them to the output. So the question is mainly, uh, what guarantees can we actually get out of this? Um, and by default, the, the default that Kafka comes with is at least once. So for several reasons, while you're, you know, if there, there are network glitches, then you can have some um, error, error cases in which duplicates uh, can be introduced during the uh, process. So it could be when you're uh, consuming the offsets, if one of, the, one of your streams processes dies, uh, or on the producer side, if you know, there's, a, there's a, a network timeout which causes a response to be uh, missed. In any of those cases, you can have duplicates uh, uh, in the stream. So the problem with that is that if you're doing any kind of aggregation or something which depends on having um, you know, any kind of uh, correct, correct result, then uh, you may be reporting that to the NASDAQ. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. So, so exactly once is an improvement over this, where we, we're able to guarantee that for this processing from input to output, you only have uh, um, you know, the input is reflected only once in the output. Um, so, but what's the downside? Well, as I said, it, you know, it doesn't come for free. There is a cost to it. And the cost comes uh, from, from two dimensions. So first off is uh, it takes some latency. So uh, the, as, as we are, I, I'll describe it in a little bit more detail in a minute. But as we are um, taking the data and writing it to the output partitions, we're basically committing a transaction. And the transaction incurs some latency cost. Now, the, that's, usually this is not so bad. I think um, you know, uh, uh, by default, you know, we're talking about 100 milliseconds additional latency, for example. Um, I, 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 off the top of my head, I don't remember what the, the parameter <laughs> is in streams. Um, Maybe but we should delete it. <laughs> OK. So the other thing that we need to keep in mind, uh, so uh, exactly once it's introduced about, um, about a year ago, um, I think you know, it, it, we have uh, the usage has been growing over time, so it, it has been stabilizing. Um, you know, it's still fairly new, though. So just keep that in mind, and, and, and you know, you need to you need to do some amount, amount of testing. And in particular, I think the main thing, the the main performance drawback at the moment is really when you have a large number of uh, partitions. So the requirements for exactly once, uh, you know, that they uh, on a per process level at the streams layer, they have more intense requirements. So as you're, you know, if you're trying to handle a streams application which has thousands and thousands of partitions, exactly once may may be uh, may be difficult. Um, so now, if we take exactly once and we break it down, so it, uh, exactly once really is composed of two pieces, kind of two building blocks. Um, so the first thing is item potence. So by default, uh, the producer. Um, if you have, you know, if we're not talking about streams, you're just talking about a regular producer application. So uh, this time we just have a producer, and it's writing to several partitions. So by default, Kafka gives you at least once guarantees, uh, and basic, basically the problem is when we do a write to the broker. If we don't get the acknowledgement back, if the connection is lost for whatever reason, then uh, we may have to retry. And in this case, we may have duplicates. So item potence is about ensuring that even if we retry, we won't have duplicates. Uh, and additionally, it ensures that when we retry, we will be able to preserve the ordering. 
Uh, and so that's the first part. It's really about ensuring the order ordering and the uh, deduplication on a per partition level. Now, the second part is transactions. Now, what transactions is doing is giving you the ability to write to multiple partitions in an atomic way. And so, so basically, when you write to the partitions uh, in a transaction, they will either all be committed or they will all uh, be aborted. So you, you get the data or you don't get any of it. You get all of it or none of it, sorry. Um, and is it just like in a database? I do begin transaction, I produce a bunch of events, and then I commit or abort? Yeah, that's exactly it. Now, on, on the producer side, yeah, that's exactly right. And on the consumption side, you know, similar to databases also, we have an isolation level. So an isolation level basically describes you know, the visibility for this transactional data. So the default out of the box is what we call read uncommitted. And read uncommitted means that we can see the data that's both part of uh, aborted transactions as well as committed transactions. Now, read committed, on the other hand, uh, we will skip over all of the aborted data, and you will only see the committed data. The downside of this, you know, as, as we talked about with streams, the downside is really that um, there's going to be some, some additional latency. Because while you're preparing this transaction, you know, you, the, the consumers in a read committed mode aren't allowed to see the data until it has been written to the, uh, uh, you know, completed, uh, so aborted the or committed. So the data is buffered by the consumer? N it's not buffered by the consumer, actually. Okay. So the, the broker has uh, some internal logic, which basically allows it to kind of see ahead and see which data is going to be aborted for and So when, when you do That's a fetch. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> When you do a fetch on the on the consumer side, uh, we'll only return uh, the data after it has been uh, completed, and uh, so that no buffering is needed on the consumer. That's fantastic. So and yeah, like I said, the down, the downside is really about about the additional latency. Um, but from a throughput perspective, you can still get very good uh, you know very good throughput. So what's the throughput you measured on uh, with? Y you know, I, I think I think uh, um, you know we were we saw maybe a five percent uh, degradation. You know, it's, it's some, something on the order like this. We, yeah, that's we, nothing really. You get you lose more just in billing SSL. Yeah, and in particular, so the thing about transactions is that they, it, uh, it you know it does require some additional logic in the application to take advantage of them. On the other hand, this uh, item potence you can use it. You know, as as Gwen wrote there, you know you just need this config to say enable item potence equals true, and there's really no cost. Uh, it has you, you can just start using it uh, without making any changes to your application. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked that I don't see more people using it. I mean, I. I've seen more uh, more than we had maybe six months ago, but it just seems like so so simple and saves you so much headache farther on with the duplication. It's like why not? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's been uh, fascinating. Okay, next question is from our old friend of the show, Scarface. Uh, I think we have a question from Scarface at every single episode, and we appreciate that. And uh, basically, I think maybe a few weeks back, I published a demo where I show how to build a data pipeline from Google Cloud. I put some data in Google Cloud. I use KSQL to manage it a bit. And then I streamed the data to BigQuery, and I ran some queries on it. And Scarface had the really reasonable question, why do you do some SQL over here and some SQL over there? How does it even make sense? And it is very reasonable. but. KSQL, even though it's SQL, is different than what BigQuery would give you as a full-fledged database. And this is something a lot of people kind of get wrong about KSQL. They imagine that if they use KSQL, it turns Kafka into a database. But KSQL is really streaming. It processes the data as it flies by. And usually, the kind of thing you do to it is a bit more etl -y. You denormalize, you do some simple aggregations. But then if you want to do the really deep analysis and compare the performance of this quarter to the performance of every quarter in the last 25 years across 15 different dimensions, this is where you bring out BigQuery. You don't want to do it on the fly, especially since you're processing 15 uh, quarters worth of data while you're doing it. So basically, KSQL for kind of ETL-like stuff. BigQuery, where you need to do long-term, kind of more big uh, data analysis. I hope that deconfuses. And you can see that, I don't know if you can see that in the demo, but I used basically KSQL for some enrichment of the data. And then um, 
BigQuery to actually aggregate and see how many we, uh, events we had of this type versus how many events we had for that type over the entire history. Next question is kind of new. I mean, the podcast has not been uh, around for maybe a month or two, and in between we had Kafka Summit. You've spoken, you've given one of the highest rated uh, talks of the entire show. <laughs> yeah, I gave a talk on uh, Kafka, our Kafka replication protocol, some of the problems that we had with it, as well as uh, how, we've, how we found the problems and how we fixed them. And if you like getting nerdy about replication protocols and you wa want to learn more about TLA+, which apparently is a trend now. I started, after you gave a talk, I started hearing so many people who were like, I bought the TLA Plus book and I'm going to learn all about TLA+. Plus. I never thought I'd see that as a trend, but it's a welcome one. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, and I think it's a great thing actually for the you know stability of software. We, you know, yes. we, we found problems with it that we didn't uh, know existed, so it was a hu huge huge value. Yes, and I definitely thank you for starting this trend. I did not expect it to be a trend, but I credit you for getting people to really to realize how practical it is. It used to be seen as, oh, just theory, and once I'm done with school, I won't have to look at it ever again. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think Leslie Lamport maybe contributes to some of that because <laughs> he kind of makes it sound a little bit scarier than it seems because he likes to talk about the mathematical aspect of it. There definitely is that there, but there's also a very pragmatic side to it where you can kind of see it more as just, just regular programming. Yes, that's amazing. So another very popular talk has been Martin Kleppmann's uh, keynote. Have you listened to it? I did, yes. <laughs> it was quite impressive. Yeah, it was impressive. And he really introduced a bunch of patterns. The, talk, the title was very controversial, but the talk itself just had a bunch of patterns that I thought are very useful. And Abhishek Gupta uh, watched this, and he had a question about the eventual consistency model. Because basically, Martin Kleppmann said, let's turn the database inside out. We'll use the stream of events as a core and use it to basically hydrate and drive a lot of uh, different applications and different databases. And he had a reasonable assumption that you'll actually, at any given point of time, my application may react to an event that does, doesn't exist in the database yet, because those two streams are in parallel. Are, they will be unsynchronized. And, and I think the idea is that maybe the application will return a result to a user, and then the user will go check something in the database, and he will see something totally different. And I think it is a concern. He asked how to solve the problem. And I'm wondering, is that's not really something that uh, exactly once solves for you? Because the, the transactions in exactly once are inside Kafka. They don't extend to external databases at all. Yeah, that's right. So exactly once really is 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 it, it exactly once guarantees that it gives you it, it covers that streams transition. So you're reading from an input topic and you're writing to an output topic, and it guarantees that the you know the input the transformation that you've made to it will be reflected only once in the output. But if you've got something that's outside of the system, then you need something else. Yeah, and I'm thinking one of the things you could do is take the principles of what we implemented and maybe uh, have something that's very idempotent on your uh, application level, so it wouldn't matter much if things diverge for a while, because you know that eventually they'll converge into something that is consistent state. And then I think that um, the, as I think the only way to really get around it is to write your applications in a way that it wouldn't. Yes, they will diverge, and we have to look at design patterns where it wouldn't matter. So try to avoid having the application that reads from Kafka immediately look for something in a database that also reads from Kafka. Just depend on one of those sources, and you'll always be consistent. You'll always have get data in order, because you're always reading it from Kafka in the right order. Don't go looking for the same data in an external database at the same time. So yeah. try to pick one source and stick with it seems to be a good solution to me. But there could be other solutions if you're going, if you solved it in another way and you want to write to us, so we'll feature your solution in the next uh, episode, we can do that. And I think that is for uh, questions. I want to show off some compliments that we've got. Uh, so Marco Rossi wrote uh, as a comment to intro to streams um, video and he said, very well explained, young man. You made my day. Thank you. And I think the young man in question is Tim Berglund, which, yeah, uh, I'm just impressed that Tim, you probably made Tim Berglund's day because you called him a young man. Let's put it <laughs> that way. And I'm glad that you now know all about Kafka streams. And then Kai Werner 
who is a beloved Confluent employee from the region of Germany, uh, wrote in uh, commenting on Viktor Gamov video. And Viktor did a video, Helm 101, explaining Kafka and Confluent platform on Kubernetes. And Kai said, he said that it was great presentation. And he said that the Kubernetes operator is going to be very useful. And he's sure that Viktor will create another video about this topic. So Kai, we're happy to inform you <laughs> that Victor recorded a new video on this exact topic just this morning. So you can expect it very, very soon. And that's it for today. That was lots of fun. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Jason. It was my pleasure, Gwen. <laughs> Great questions from the community as usual. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to give exactly once a try as we learned, if you use a Dempotent producer, there is basically no drawbacks, and you will never miss your duplicates. As well as if you find any issues, make sure to report them. Yes, is uh, issues.kafka.apache.org. Uh, <laughs>